Now, one very, very important thing to remember whenever glazing is the whole fat over lean principle, which is a little bit outdated these days. But first, we're going to get right to Eric Johnson. He's going to start out by showing us how to make paint. Eric, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, let's do this. All righty. Well, welcome, everybody. So what we have here is just a marble, you know, just a honed marble slab. If you do want to grind your own paint, the best things to use is a hard stone like marble or granite. It's very important that they're not polished, but that they're honed or raw or just rough a bit. You can even use a textured glass. If you only have a um, just a smooth piece of glass, you can always buy silicon carbide and actually grind um, or rough it up yourself. So what we have here is the difference between natural ultramarine and synthetic ultramarine. Today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the natural ultramarine. This is actually natural ultramarine from lapis lazuli. The mineral is called lazurite. This is from natural pigments. Now, when using some natural pigments like this, um, for example, lapis lazuli, natural ultramarine, malachite, azurite, some of those older world colors, one of the things that you'll notice is their pigment particle size has a tendency to be fairly large, almost like coarse sand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spit some of this out. Where I just want just the pigment. What you're doing, what Eric's doing now is he's getting rid of the oil that accumulated in the tube. So this is a fairly expensive tube and I've, shamefully let this tube sit around for a bit too long. So sometimes you will have some pigment and oil separation. Now this paint is from natural. Eric, pigment what's the Rufus. best, what's the best way uh, to store your tubes, horizontal, vertical, upside down? Is there a better I, way? I, I actually store my tubes like this flat, yeah. but on a good, you know, on a good period of time, I will periodically just, I, you know, I've got a cabinet of all my paint. I'll tap it like this. I'll kind of massage the tube, and I'll keep I'll keep agitating the paint. That way, that pigment and oil separation. Uh, this tube has gotten away from me, but you know that's the whole reason or the whole purpose as to why we're mixing some of that paint up to begin with. Now, so I, I'm confused because you said you were going to make paint, yet you pulled some out of a tube. What's the story? The the story is paint straight out of the tube, even if it's in a paste form. Is not going to be always um, the right viscosity. So what I have here is the genuine ultramarine straight out of the tube, and it's very gritty. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix some synthetic and some natural ultramarine next to it, and then what we're going to do is we're essentially going to combine them. Mm -hmm. So the pigment particle size is the most important thing. So whether you are actually making your own paint or if you are making, or if you're just using it straight from the tube, I think that there is a certain level of experience that comes from making paint that will give you a new control over the viscosity and the transparency of your colors, which will allow an easier job painting, be it direct painting or glazing. I want to just mention something, Eric, because I think it's very important. I encountered an artist recently who who would, would buy pigment and make his own paint like you're doing here, uh, and they can't see that yet, so hang on just a second. But um, what happened is uh, even though he thought he was being careful, there were microscopic particles that were in the air that he was breathing in, and he actually developed cancer in his sinuses, and they actually had to take his face off and cut into his skull and open up his sinuses to get it out. And they said it was caused by, and he was using a lot of uh, toxic colors like cadmiums and so on. Oh, and uh, so you want to be careful to wear a mask. And I think even eye protection, Eric wears gloves as well. Yeah, okay. I don't mix any toxic pigments um, in my studio anymore or make toxic paints in my studio, but I think that always treating, even a, even a pigment that is less toxic, you should always treat it with the utmost um, respect. 
Yeah. So I just for the pe- for the benefit of the people who might not understand what's happening here, those two s- spots of color on the right are powders, and that's how nat- that's how pigment comes. You can buy it in jars of pigment, so you can mix it yourself. Exactly. So here we've got a synthetic ultramarine, and here we have a natural ultramarine. So one of the things that you're going to notice is that the synthetic ultramarine is wildly stronger. So when making our paint, our paint starts off as, you know, dry powdered pigment, and we have to add the glue or the oil to it. The the best oil that I like to use is a very high acid linseed oil. So I avoid using walnut oils or, you know, any oil that's, you know, not uh, linseed oil because linseed oil offers a superior drying, even though it might yellow a bit faster. I say faster because there's this common misconception that a walnut oil actually isn't going to yellow, but it actually will. It's just the rate at which the walnut and the linseed oil yellow is different but they will yellow to about the same degree. So now what about, what about clean linseed oil? You know, Dan Graves video talks about how to clean your, your video and he, I, I, how to clean your, your oils. And he goes through the process of doing that also how to make lead paint. So watching your linseed oil, I think is a, is a great, um, is, is a great thing to do. So when you wash or clean your linseed oil, what you're essentially doing is cleaning out the water, water soluble impurities called mucilage. So a refined linseed oil is typically going to be a hot pressed linseed oil, which is going to result in less of that mucilage. Meanwhile, a cold pressed linseed oil is going to have much more of that mucilage and much more of those impurities. To get those impurities out, you can actually use water and pretty much wash the impurities out. Now, synthetic ultramarine has a very, very small particle size, which makes the color very, very vibrant. It's all, it's a, it's a fairly easy color to make. We just put this on and then just use small circular motions. We can use figure eights. You're using a glass Mueller? I'm using a marble. Or no, I'm using it. Yes, I am using a glass. Uh, I'm glass molar and I am grinding yeah. on marble. Okay. So one of the interesting things is you sometimes see analysis of old masters paint and you will commonly find calcium carbonate in the, um, in the composition of the paint. Now, sometimes, you know, it is interpreted that the artist put that calcium carbonate or that chalk or marble dust into the paint. The other time, other, you know, other, there's other speculation that just grinding on a marble slab like this or a marble tile can be enough to introduce some of that calcium carbonate to the paint. Interesting. So here we've got our synthetic ultramarine. I'm just going to put that up here. I'm just going to take a moment and just wipe down. Hello, Auckland, New Zealand. Hello, Belfast. Let's see where else we've got. Scrolling through your comments. One important thing is to always throw away oily rags um, because oil can spontaneously combust. Now we're going to take the uh, natural ultramarine. We're going to mix it with just about the same, same oil. Now that looks, gonna- a lot, that looks a lot lighter. Is the oil going to darken it? Yep, so adding the oil is going to darken it. So this is a different shade. So depending on the quality of the lapis, you will get different shades of blue. That's why all of the blues throughout history are not always the exact same hue. So this is a slightly lesser grade of ultramarine, which is kind of nice to have as a, um, a step up from our deeper, richer, higher quality natural ultramarine that came straight out of the tube. Because in order to brighten this, I would either have to add white or some other blue pigment. In this case, I can add this other blue pigment 
And that's going to allow me to brighten the value without um, relying on white, which is going to desaturate my chroma and also make my paint just a bit more opaque. Now, this is, you can, I don't know if you can hear, but this paint is very kind of gritty. Yeah, now, you can when, hear it. When you're mixing these natural pigments, especially genuine ultramarine, one thing to keep in mind is they are colored crystals, essentially. So just like a rose quartz um, gets its color from uh, the impurities in it, you know, the, the, the lazurite is, you know, a very predominantly silica-based pigment. So if we grind this up too far, it's going to desaturate it. It's going to lose its color. So how do you it, know? How do you know? Um, you can just see it. So there's a fine balance here between the pigment being too coarse, because it will be like painting with rough sand, and the pigment size being too small, which will noticeably make the color look more gray. So it's usually recommended that you just mix it up with your palette knife. But having used both of these paints before and the delicacy of my painting, I know that I need to reduce the pigment particle size a little bit. Now, I'm going to use my, my molar and I'm just going to pinch it like this. I'm not going to grab, grab hard and push down really heavily. I'm just going to hold it like this. I'm going to let just the friction of the two grind up that color. It's kind of like uh, figures on a chalkboard. I know, I know. <laughs> just give it a minute, it'll get more quiet. You can see very quickly, you can actually yeah. hear the fact that the particle size decreases. Yeah. And that's essentially all I want to do. I'm gonna grab some off of the edge, do that again. Now, whenever we reduce the pigment particle size, we do increase the surface area. In other words, we're going to need to add a little bit more oil when we reduce the pigment particle size because the paint will be more, um, it will be more stiff. Now, I'm using a relatively large particle size paint right now. One thing that you can do to make working with a large particle size paint a bit easier is to add a vacuum body linseed oil or a polymerized linseed oil such as sand oil, which is, which is what it's commonly known as. There's a big difference between the sand oil that we have and the sand oil that the old masters would have had. Um, in other words, the old way of making sand oil was to quite literally put linseed oil in a bucket and, you know, close the bucket up and just crack the lid a little bit and let that stand or sit for a very long time. And eventually that oil would polymerize and oxidize. Um, that oxidation is where the main issue is, and you know, in, in my opinion, because that oxidation can lead to um, additional darkening, yellowing, and even cracking. So it's best to have an oil that is only polymerized but not oxidized at all. So I'm going to use yeah, a medium viscosity vacuum body linseed oil, and I'm just going to add a drop into my paint. This is going to act like a, a thicker, viscous glue. Uh, it's, it has a honey-like consistency. And that's what we're going for is just something to just unify those larger particles. You can see how much more uniform the paint is. It doesn't have that kind of stiff, kind of gritty feel. And that's because there's just a thicker, viscous glue covering it. So I'm just going to give that a quick mull to get a good pigment oil agglomeration. Now, right now we're using a very transparent pigment all by itself. So if we were not using a transparent pigment, let's say we were using cadmium red or we were using cadmium yellow or bone black, you know, some other um, opaque color, even lead white. What I could do is I could take my paint, I can bring it to my slab, and I could introduce some other transparent pigment. This could be 
the chalk or the calcium carbonate. This could be barite or barium sulfate. I could even add clear glass powder or fumed silica. So the goal here is to introduce transparency through the use of transparent pigments as opposed to adulterating the pigment volume concentration. So that's typically known as the PVC, um, the critical pigment volume concentration, which is a point where the paint is neither extremely glossy nor extremely matte, but you know has just enough oil to bind and you know completely cover all of those pigment particles successfully. That's essentially okay. what you're going for. There's a question from Kirk Larson, the great painter in, in upstate New York. He says, hello from Hicksville, New York. Always great to understand more about the pigments we use and choose. How does safflower or walnut affect the mix versus linseed? So to the best of my knowledge, um, if, we're, if we're talking safflower of the high oleic um, variety, that's that's probably the best safflower oil that you can use. Each is going to give you a different um, character to the paint. For example, safflower and walnut oils have a tendency to make a softer paint overall with better flow out and leveling, which is essentially the paint strokes aren't going to be quite as sharp. Um, my main issue is, sem is with semi-drying oils and even drying oils, which, you know, we can categorize safflower in a semi-drying or a drying oil, depending on which variety they are that we're using. My issue with walnut in particular is the fact that when the oil dries, it swells, it expands. And then over a month or so, um, it shrinks back to the size that it was when it was originally wet. Now, when linseed oil dries, you know, there's, if there's a smell, if you can smell the linseed oil, there's some volatile organic compound. There's some um, solvent that evaporates, which is allowing this to be fluid, right? So it's inevitable. It's going to expand. It's going to contract. And it's going to contract a tad bit smaller than the original mass or the original volume that we have here. Now, with linseed oil, that happens just a little. With walnut oil in particular, that this the mass or the weight of the, the oil gets actually quite a bit less than it was when it was originally wet. That's a big issue because that means your paint layer expands and then contracts at a greater degree than let's say linseed oil would. would. And that can be a recipe for cracking. Having said that, there are there's only hundreds of years of, you know, Dutch artists using, you know, lead white number twos, which would be lead whites in, you know, uh, walnut oil. We've got Sargent using lead whites exclusively in safflower oil. So, you know, it, it's, it, it, it depends on what you're going for. I'm not worried about the oil yellowing because I use, you know, high quality, clean, refined linseed oils for the most part. So, you know, this, you know, I'm using just, you know, a consistent oil across the board. I'd be a little bit more worried about mixing different oils that have different drying times. Like I know exactly what to expect. Um, in, you know, ultra, genuine ultramarine's case, um, it's a very poor drying color. I mean, if you put a pure, you know, even if it's synthetic ultramarine, it's going to take forever to dry. Um, natural ultramarine is no, um, uh, is not immune to that either. It's also a very slow drying color. So, I wouldn't use any slower drying oil period just to make sure that my paint doesn't stay sticky or gummy because it's just a dust magnet. Okay. Um, hey, I want to tell everybody to hang in there because in just a minute, we're going to uh, take this paint and then use it to glaze. And you're going to see what, how a glaze can make a painting just come alive. So you want to stick here for that. I'm okay, going to set up so the pilot right now. Okay, so you've got three piles of three different. One is uh, came out of a tube. Uh, one is a synthetic, and one is a lighter yes, ultramarine. Correct. And this is right. going to let me avoid using white. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to get set up. Is that right for your next That's bit? Correct. Okay, why don't I do this? I'm going to come back on and just say we've got a um, 
a promo I just want to share for you guys. It's on Eric Johnson's uh, video that came out in 2019, which is about um, uh, those. It was the celebration of Rembrandt's anniversary, but he has replicated, has figured out how Rembrandt painted. At least this is what he believes. And as you can tell, he's very scientific. And uh, you just want to watch this. This this will blow you. Rembrandt. Considered one of the greatest artists in history and known for his lifelike and expressive portraits. Rembrandt created mood with dramatic light, thick paint and thin glazes. This year, the world is celebrating the year of Rembrandt, marking the 350th anniversary of this great master's death. And yet, artists around the world are still studying his work to inform their own trying to understand his techniques to give life and drama to their own paintings. Countless numbers of artists, whether students or professionals, have copied Rembrandt's work in order to better understand how and why his work is so historically significant. Yet few ever really figured it out because of his unique layering approach, which made him the master's master. In honor of the year of Rembrandt, and because so many artists want to understand Rembrandt more, in conjunction with Fine Art Connoisseur magazine, we began a worldwide search to find the one artist most capable of understanding and teaching Rembrandt's work at the highest level. That extensive search of the world's best Rembrandt copyists led us to an artist who has not only mastered the art of creating Rembrandt-style paintings in his own work, he has scoured ancient texts in foreign languages in order to understand every small detail. From how Rembrandt created his paint, how he prepared his canvas, how he layered paint, even how he used a simple technique to rough in the first layer without requiring a lot of drawing skill. Our search led us to a young artist who has spent the last decade obsessing about Rembrandt. And once you see him paint or listen to him talk, you'll instantly understand why we chose him over hundreds of other artists to be your teacher. One of the things that you'll find about Rembrandt is he and all of his other Dutch contemporaries had a very systematic way of working. A very logical order of painting that ensures a success at the end of every work. In Rembrandt's Secrets Revealed, artist Eric Johnson is going to show you everything that Rembrandt did that, without knowing it, would make him a timeless legend. You're going to see it all as Eric demonstrates a complete start-to-finish Rembrandt painting titled Self-Portrait at Age 23. And if you compare the original side-by-side, -side, it's amazingly accurate. You can observe and practice each and every step so you can create your own Rembrandt paintings. Also, you can give your paintings drama by employing Rembrandt's techniques. Seven full hours of detailed instruction that is easily understood by beginners and pros alike. All throughout the film, Eric includes information on the paint and materials used during Rembrandt's time period and suggests modern alternatives. You'll also hear many historical painting facts and tips that will help deepen and enrich your knowledge. You'll treasure this video because of the knowledge and skills you'll develop to increase your significance as an artist. Available on DVD or digitally to view on your computer, tablet or smartphone. In celebration of the official year of Rembrandt, Rembrandt Secrets Revealed with Eric Johnson. Order yours today. This became a huge selling video in the celebrations of Rembrandt's anniversary. A lot of people still are buying it. And it's really wonderful. I have a prized possession right here. I have my own Rembrandt, right? So it is absolutely incredible. Uh, this is an Eric Johnson. This is the one he did in the video. And uh, to be able to stare at that in my office every day, it's kind of hard with the light here showing it. But this, you can learn how to do this, and Eric can teach you how. So I think it's, it's very valuable. We're going to go back to Eric. Now he's going to start glazing. All right, Eric. How are you doing? Um, so what, um, I'm sorry, what was that? Are you saying you're great? Um, what we have here is I've got my, I've got my three um, ultramarines. 
I think it's nice to have more than one color, um, more than one ultramarine. If I if I need to, you know, bump some of the chroma up even higher, I'm going to use a little bit of the synthetic because it's a 21st century, so why not? Um, the colors on my palette, we have a lead white number one. I have added some crystal leaded powder glass to that. Um, this is a lead tin yellow type two, which is a lead, which is the lead tin yellow that you'd see commonly used by Vermeer. Um, this is the lead tin yellow that has silica in it or, you know, powdered glass as well, as opposed to the lead white number one, or I'm sorry, the lead tin yellow type one, which is more of an opaque lead tin, or a lead tin yellow type one, which is more opaque lead tin yellow. We have a yellow ochre, a genuine vermilion, and then a uh, genuine rose matter, a synthetic alizarin, and a bone black. I don't have any um, earth, I don't have any raw umber. I won't need it. I probably won't need the alizarin as well. Um, but that's just what's on my palette. In case you're wondering, lead white number one, lead tin yellow type two, a yellow ochre, genuine vermilion, rose matter, alizarin, and bone black. So what, what I've got here is this was a painting that I did as a demo for one of, uh, one of my webinars over the, um, over the summer. Now I've got some sections that have been painted more thoroughly and other sections that have not. So I may need a little bit of extra brightness here. So I might actually have to opaquely paint an area while glazing the darker values. As you can imagine, glazing with those transparent dark pigments are going to darken in general. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm going to glaze my shadows and get those at a richer and darker um, value and color first. Now I'm actually not going to oil out because when you oil out, you're essentially what you're doing is you're applying you know, unpigmented oil, which is going to, if you don't completely paint on top of it, it's going to dry without any pigment. And that's going to create a very thin, glassy and brittle layer of linoxin that's essentially just the dry, that's essentially just the dry oil. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off by taking a synthetic, this is a spectrum brush from Trakel. Um, I'm just gonna take a synthetic um, bright, this is a spectrum brush. I'm gonna grab some of my genuine ultramarine And I'm just going to apply it to my shadow. I might actually just take uh, an even larger brush with a larger amount. And we'll get you a little closer to this as well so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to grab a synthetic hog bristle. Just a bigger brush. I might even touch the tiniest, tiniest bit of that Synthetic ultramarine. And I'm just going to reapply the paint just in the shadows. One, one thing that I've learned from just studying, you know, a lot of the old masters is just how simply they painted or how simple their palettes were in general. But I think it's important to always keep an open mind whenever making, you know, assumptions, you know, educated, um, educated guesses on their techniques. And always, you know, remember that, you know, older artists are just like, you know, us, constantly learning, constantly experimenting. So their knowledge and experience is always expanding and so should ours. So it's so hard to, um, so I'll turn it back on, there you go. Oh, 30 minute warning. It's hard to uh, essentially uh, group too much under one, one method or one technique, but by choosing a specific century or by choosing a specific artist and really kind of deep diving into the you know, ways that they would have done it, um, to me, that's always been the most um, exciting and useful. Now I'm going to take that smaller brush. 
I'm going to grab more of the lighter Genuine Ultramarine. I'm going to start applying a glaze into the light family. Now this is this of course is going to darken it. Now can you can you just touch on I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just touch on why glaze instead of just painting it in at the time. What what is the benefit of that? So I've had this conversation with a lot of students recently because glazing is such a broad term that we do have to assess, you know, just like you're asking, like the why. So there are, there are multiple reasons why glazing would be useful or a good thing to do. So in this case, I'm glazing because I want the look of that natural ultramarine. I want that old world look when I could rightfully use synthetic ultramarine and get colors that were more vibrant. Yeah. Now, I am enhancing the vibrancy of my natural ultramarine by applying it over a lighter foundation. That's going to let my, allow my color to look darker and richer and higher chroma. Now, there's one thing that you know I, I generally try to discourage, and that's doing a fully opaque, you know, grisaille like this. So this is a painting that I did as a demo for my students um, just the other day. What now, is a grisaille? Tell what this is a grisaille. So. You could technically do a full monochrome painting like this and then glaze over that. But because of some of the darkness, especially in the darks, your glazes will lean more um, desaturated to whatever that darkness was. So one key element here is whenever glazing, it's important to glaze over a brighter foundation for the most part. Okay. Now, there's so you other, don't make your darks as dark as you would otherwise because you know you're going to darken them in the glaze. Exactly. And that can also be a very useful way to avoid oiling out, which has lots of negative ramifications leading to excessive yellowing and darkening and cracking. So if you leave your values just a little bit light in your underpainting and are successively glazing over them to get around, for example, I could have oiled out this shadow. But what, what, that, what would that have even shown me other than the fact that I could hit, apply the glaze over it anyway? So th there's other reasons why one would glaze. For example, in, in this painting, in this painting that there. he's looking for <laughs> that was in front of it so in this yeah. painting this painting that i did of my daughter i i glazed right after my underpainting and then i wiped away which you see many um artists like velasquez or rembrandt do to create more feeling of texture where there is a thickly in, thickly painted impasto so what I did there is I actually painted black over the entire thing and then wiped away using a wipeout method. So I was glazing bone black and raw umber with perhaps a tiny bit of that powdered glass to um, give more relief to the texture of my you know thickly painted impasto. So you could use a glaze to not enhance the color, but to actually enhance the textural variety of the paint that you actually have down in the previous layer. Now, one very, very important thing to remember whenever glazing is the whole fat over lean principle, which is a little bit outdated these days. Um, we, could, we could recapitulate our understanding of fat over lean as more flexible over less flexible. For example, I would want my very first layers in my painting to dry quickest and also to dry hardest. Quick and quick and hard, some are usually kind of with, e with each other, with um, you know, as, as opposed to you know, you know, a soft dry, which you know, would be, you know, I couldn't do this if the paint was still soft. Now, you will want to paint on a panel. You want liken your painting to the building of a house. You don't want to build your foundation of your house on sand. You want to build it on top of a solid foundation. So starting with 
you know, more flexible over less flexible, a hard panel is going to be less flexible compared to a stretched linen or a stretched canvas. Your earliest layers should dry quickest or be the hardest dried. And then each subsequent layer should be um, finished curing and finished drying at a later time or at a slower rate than the layers underneath. So if we're using lots of, if, for example, if we use a very slow drying ultramarine, thickly painted, and then try to paint raw umber over it, which will dry very fast, we could deal with some very negative, um, some very negative uh, repercussions. Um, which will lead to cracking. This is one of the reasons why I had certain hangups about the addition of mediums um, added at random quantities, you know, on your in your mixtures, is because you adulterate the viscosity so much that it's hard to control the pigment volume concentration. If you want to add more flow to your paint, reduce the particle size, um, grind grind the pigment a little bit. Maybe add, you know, smaller or more viscous fluids like stand oil, which can make it a little bit more fluid. Um, I generally try to avoid mineral spirits or any solvents because of their toxicity, um, you know, in my airspace. But also when you use a lot of mineral spirits or solvents, what you're doing is you're decreasing the viscosity of the oil to a point or to a degree that it will allow their substrate or the paint layers to suck up some of that oil. That is what we call sinking in. That's when your paint starts to look matte finish. I'm just gonna cover up this whole area. I'm just gonna kind of scumble at it like this. Um, sinking in is caused by the oil getting sucked into the substrate. So of course, a less absorbent substrate is going to lead to less sinking in. One of the reasons why I generally like vacuum body linseed oil or stand oil is because it allows my paint to not sink in quite as much. So you really want to be careful, you know, with the materials that you use, not only for toxicity, but also for the nuisances of um, what, you know, what, you know, the, the challenges of just painting from one layer to the next. Well, that's really increasing the intensity. I'm sure in person, the brilliance is so much, um, so much brighter. How long does your underpainting need to dry before you, you go on top? Does it need to be completely dry? You should be able to take a knuckle, twist 90 degrees, 180 degrees, something like that. And there'll be no paint on, on your finger. All right. Um, hard dry is I hard dry is ideal because if you can do that and you still get paint on your knuckle, it's you're not coming to a hard dry. Now this goes back to me choosing linseed oil as opposed to walnut or safflower oil. You usually hear that walnut oil or safflower oil do not come to as hard of a dry as linseed oil. And this is where that this is where that knowledge comes full circle. A safflower oil or a walnut oil paint will dry a bit softer in general, or the oil film won't be as hard. Yeah, which I used have a tendency to chalk. I use the Rubeloff gel. Uh, oleo which, gel? Which, yes, which is uh, oleo gel, which is linseed oil. Correct. That's a mixture of linseed oil and fume silica. I really love the oleo gel. I actually have a little bit here um, on my palette, just in case I need to change the viscosity of one of my paints while imparting some transparency. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I love that oleo gel is because it's 70%, it's 70% oil, 30% fume silica. And if you have ever bought a bag full of fume silica, always buy, you would know that you always want to buy way less than you intended because <laughs> it's so light, it's so fluffy that you get, if you thought you were just buying, you know, a pound of it, you'd get a bag the size of your chest. I mean, there's one human being can't use that much fume silica in their entire lifetime. Um, so the amount of that transparent pigment is so much greater, even though we're talking 70% oil, the, just the weight, the molecular weight of the fume silica is just so low that, you know, you're, we're, we're dealing with this kind of just 
transparent, friendly gel with the paint, as opposed to lots of unnamed chemicals yeah. and alkyds, you know, that require solvents. Well, um, and yeah, and some some things they put in, in some people put in things are deadly, and you mm -hmm. don't want those uh, those particles floating around in your lungs. Exactly, exactly, and that's why you know whenever I whenever I have you know the the clear glass powder, this is this is crystal leaded glass, which essentially has the lead oxide in it, like a good you know um, leaded uh, window scotch glass, good scotch crystal. Um, that that acts as a faster dryer. But I make I make that into a medium with oleo gel for glazing. Um, but I do that um, outside, like full hazmat, you know, face mask, lead respirator, and I do do it very, very, very carefully. But I also never sand my paintings as well. Yeah. You know, that that to me is just a terrifying because you know I I do so much work to have a, a nice surface on my painting that you know i i can't imagine scratching it it's too too brutal or intense for my liking one time i came home from uh a couple of weeks away in europe uh, Lori and i were on a trip and the kids had been with us a sitter or family member and i walked into my studio and it was covered with yellow powder oh goodness and my son had gotten into a big jar of lead tin yellow and it just spread everywhere. And I fear, oh I fear what happens to him down the road. And I, so I caution people be real careful. I, I started putting all my, my pigments in places where my kids couldn't get to them. Yeah. I've got a big, scary looking, um, like Spanish Renaissance desk, um, that has a lock on it. That's where I keep all of my pigments, but yeah, that you, you can never be too careful. You know, even the ones that are considered low toxicity, yeah, all of them are treated with the same level of care as the most toxic pigment. Um, yeah. yeah. And I don't even like to use, um, you know, pigments indoors now because, you know, I just have my young daughter. But I'm, um, I always have a HEPA filter going. I'm always mopping and you know you know scrubbing the air wiping down um dusty surfaces so I, I do everything that i can i test lead on every door handle i wear gloves while i paint when i leave my studio i take the gloves off and throw them away so i, I could use a rag to lighten so as opposed to adding white to lighten i can just use a rag to lighten using just the thickness or thinness of the paint as opposed to adding white, which is going to desaturate it. Yeah. Well, I can it's also use a brush to just move that paint around to, um, you know, put a higher quantity of that glaze in an area that I want to be darker. Well, white can make things very chalky looking and, um, and, and that's where glazing I think really makes a big difference. I mean, you look at the chalkiness of what's not glazed versus mm -hmm. what is glazed. It's amazing. Exactly. From, from in here, I can't. I can't really tell in person. Oh no, it's it's pretty accurate. It's what what you see is pretty accurate. I've put more more time than you'd know on just making making my camera set up as accurate as I can for everyone. And I'm just gonna go over this. I mean, so what's the point of oiling it out? This you know goes back to my. This goes back to my statement earlier. Why even oil it out if I'm going to glaze over it anyway? And you can see I'm, I'm relying on the paint that I made much more so than the paint out of the tube just because of the value of it. When it comes to the darker values, I'll use the darker ultramarine. When it comes to the lighter values, I'll use the lighter ultramarine. The key here is also if what you did underneath is not good, the glaze isn't always going to save you. So <laughs> it's very important to have your underpaintings well established. Yeah, your brush strokes are going to show through. Mm -hmm. All the values, everything that you have down is going to show through. Now, when I did this painting, I did the, the entire, you know, this entire painting was essentially recorded during a webinar for the students that took it. Um, I did... I think four different types of underpainting in this painting. 
just to show what I thought was a good way to do an underpainting, and just to show that you know most of them are going to end up the same result. Now, the one that I did that grayscale painting for is the arm here, which still looks a little bit more gray. Here, I actually used synthetic ultramarine and white. I mean, why not just let the, let the white chalk up the synthetic ultramarine and do the underpainting for what is going to be glazed in just the blue and white to begin with? You know, so since we're you know, already halfway there, then as we glaze over, then we can increase that richness. So, um, you know, there's so many different ways to do an underpainting. And, you know, you'll get slightly different effects. But I personally um, do really like direct painting. So if I can get as close as possible in just one layer of just blue and blue and white, um, that will that will just make my job or my life easier when I get down to glazing like this. I'll tell you a trick that I learned from the man who taught me, um, uh, who had studied under Signorita Simi and Florence and under um, Ives Gamble and some and Frank Riley. Uh, he went out and found a very textured cloth or a very textured paper cloth and a uh, paper, paper, um, paper towel. And after he would glaze, he would lay that paper towel down and he would rub it in and it would pull some of the paint up and it would then make the fabric look like it was check textured. That's a good idea. It, it was very effective. I have a painting here I did th 20 years ago. Where I did that, and it and and it made the the dress look like it was lace. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why I tried to reduce the particle size of my glaze um, beforehand because I planned on actually doing this with just a rag. Now, because the pigment is so hard. I don't know if you've ever tried to crush up a piece of lapis, but my goodness, that that mineral is hard. Um, if I if I rub too much, I think that I will have the same effect that you're talking about without needing the textured um, textured cloth or textured rag. Yeah, I'm, I'm essentially you know wet sanding the painting yeah. every single time I rem you know try to remove. So I'm trying to be very very gentle. Yeah, or you can take it. You could create create designs with a you know with a, one of those little rubber tip things. Uh, let's see. This Catherine says, Eric, can you show us the picture? I I assume she means the one that I did twenty years ago. No, it's hanging in the bathroom. Uh, I'm not bringing it out. It's not something I want to show anybody. <laughs> uh, we get better over time. Eric, I want to mention to you that I. Uh, you and I went out plein air painting when you were here and uh, you set your painting down in my studio to dry. I don't think I ever gave it to you. So I'll, I'll try to find it and send it to you. Okay. All right. That'll I think we're going to, I, I think we have essentially the essence of how this is done. You keep layering over it a little bit more to get some texture or some sense. Why don't you come back on camera real quick so everybody can meet you if they came in late. Our guest today is Eric Johnson, and uh, he is a superstar. As you can tell, he's very scientific in his approach. And uh, thank goodness for people like Eric. And, and also for really uh, keeping the old master's styles and techniques alive. And that's one of the reasons we did the video. Eric, thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you. Uh, everybody give uh, Eric thumbs up and applause. We put links in there for his webinar series. Uh, he's got a couple of different ones. Uh, make sure you follow him on, on Instagram and TikTok. We'll put that in the comments. And uh, Eric, you're a very, very important guy in my mind, and you're, you're a huge inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Have you ever wondered how some artists get such realistic quality in their work? You know, unbelievably beautiful portraits, stunning figures, and realistic-looking still lifes or florals? Painting or drawing realism takes your work to a whole new level. Whether you want tight, carefully rendered realistic paintings or looser, more impressionistic realism, 
Most high-level artists will tell you that painting is a skill that anyone can learn. If you follow a process, you can paint beautiful, realistic artwork. But where do you learn? You could spend $3,000 or more to attend a live workshop or convention. Or you can learn from the world's finest realist from home for a fraction of the cost. At Realism Live, the world's first virtual online realism conference, you'll get three days of world-class artists demonstrating their techniques and processes. This is a comprehensive conference covering all the subjects you want to learn in portraiture, figures, landscapes, still life, cityscapes, color mixing, and more. Taught by the world's leading artists. Not only will you learn their techniques, you'll have a chance to interact with instructors and get your questions answered. And you'll get to know other artists personally through our breakout sessions. And we'll even paint and draw together at the end of each day. Make new friends in our breakout sessions. Paint with hundreds of others. Get private access to our exclusive members group to become a part of our community and learn to take your artwork to a higher level. Realism Live is three full days of painting and drawing instruction, November 10th through 12th. And for people who want to learn painting and drawing from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day One Day Atelier on November 9th. Soon you'll be painting faces, people, flowers, scenery, objects, and other subjects. You'll see your artwork improve faster as you learn from top artists and instructors from all over the world. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together from these amazing artists. Glenn Vilpu, John Potoshenek, Alex Kelly, Ned Mueller, Terry Strickland, Dustin Van Welchel, Lisa Egwe, Clyde Aspavig, Sarah Sedwick, Rose Franson, Chuck Morris, Michelle Dunaway, Michael Mittler, Daniel Graves, Leona Shanks, Alexander Shanks, Juliet Aristides, Carol Peebles, Tony Pro, Todd M. Casey, Cornelia Hernes, Sandra Angelo, Oliver Sin, Sharon Sprung, Mario Robinson, Deborah Hughes, and many more to be announced. And it's hosted by fine art connoisseur and publisher Eric Rhodes and editor-in-chief Peter Trippi. And if you can't watch live, you can watch replays on your own time for up to a year. And it's 100% guaranteed. You'll be pleasantly surprised to realize just how much you can learn in such a short time. Realism Live, from the publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. Sign up today to reserve your seat now.